Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. We're good? Okay. Well, I'm just so honored to be here today, um, and I think our panel is going to be fantastic. It's a super important issue, and uh, the, the lack of political action and how to, how to influence our politicians is so important. Before I get started, uh, I'd like to know, I think we all would like to know a little bit about you guys in the audience. So uh, I'd just like to see a show of hands. How many of you here are American, are, are going to be voting or, okay, a lot of you. All right, put your hands down. How many of you are registered to vote in the United States? Okay. There you go, excellent. And I guess the last question, uh, and we'll let you talk to, we'll let you talk to us a little bit. And we'll let you talk to us a little bit after we tell you a few things. How many of you have attempted to influence our leaders in any way possible? Written, calls, whatever. Okay, very good. All right, thank you so much for that. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so before we get to a few questions that I have for our panel, I just want to tell you a little bit about how I came to this. I am a political uh, correspondent. I'm based in New York, but I am also a generalist. And uh, in the last couple of years, I'm a parent. I've become very interested in um, climate change. I live in New York, uh, which is going to be affected, obviously, by rising sea levels. And I became uh, very involved in it earlier this year uh, after a trip to Antarctica, which I took in December, where I learned things like... Um, 70% of our fresh water and 90% of our ice is, in, is held in the ice pack on the continent of Antarctica. And one side of it is sliding into the ocean thanks to warmer water. And when that, that is going to happen, there's no question that it's going to happen now. Um, and that's gonna lead to a lot of, obviously, more water. And about a month later, through the vicissitudes of covering national politics, I found myself sitting on the beach in Miami, looking at the ocean and thinking about what I had just learned in uh, Antarctica and having studied in order to do this project I was doing down there about politicians and rising sea level, uh, having studied it and, and noticed that uh, the prediction for Miami is six foot sea level rise by the end of the century. And after that, while I, was, I sat there for a while and contemplated that, and then I went, and it was raining, and it's not supposed to rain in Miami in January. They were having a very weird weather uh, pattern. I went straight off in, and found myself in a small room with about six or eight very desperate local mayors. And these people are dealing, because Miami is a city of municipalities, the problem of rising sea level is already happening in Miami, as it is already happening in many parts of the world. And it's happening in one of the greatest cities on the world, really, in the world. Uh, these local leaders are left holding the bag, trying to figure out what to do with whenever it rains, the streets are filled with water, they have to spend hundreds of million do millions of dollars for pumping water to make new drainage systems. But more than that, they're already talking about moving infrastructure, moving hospitals, and moving people. Now this conversation is going on in a small room in Miami. Meanwhile, two, of, two people from Miami are running for president. Remember there were 17 Republicans early? Two of them are from Miami. They were in the process of having debates on obviously they're running their, their fitness for office. And over the period of months, not one of them ever mentioned what was happening in their hometown. And furthermore, the topic didn't even come up in the Republican debates. I think it came up once. So that experience for me, and I'm, I'm, an, um, I'm an unbiased observer. As a journalist, I'm supposed to be an unbiased observer. Felt like such a gigantic dereliction of duty, and it upset me very much. So I'm very interested in, in hearing um, about what our experts, all of these, these three people who know so much about politics and who work with politicians who are in politics, are gonna tell us about the ways that we can influence our politicians to make them actually act on things like this. So to begin, I think we've had, an, we've had some introductions. Do you feel like 
would, would you like me to tell, tell them a little bit more about each of you? I think I'll just, because Jan, let's just go straight in. Okay. Um, so uh, we're gonna t what we're going to do is, is uh, we're going to ask a few questions. We're going to discuss uh, things, and then we'll let you guys uh, talk to us. So the first question is that I'd like each of you to, to address is um, uh, we have a lot of people here from Holland, from the Netherlands, interestingly, and um, Jan is one of them. Uh, if any country in the world knows what it's like to be under, uh, to have rising sea levels, it's this country that has, it's under uh, the sea level, and they, uh, the dikes around it protect it from this sea level rise. And I always heard the story of the, the boy who stuck his finger in the dike, and that was sort of the Hans Christian Andersen history of of the Netherlands, but I've since been told that actually uh, a bunch of farmers got together sometime in the Middle Ages and brought consensus to this issue that, that they all had to address. And so I'm wondering, and I'd like each of you to address this for a few minutes, how can we in our era emulate that? How can we get consensus? How can we get our politicians to agree to and our voters to agree to invest in something that's going to help us all for a problem that's coming in the future. Christine, you want to start? Well, thank you. Well, it's it's not a problem that's coming in the future. It's a problem that we are living with right now. Um, I come from Tasmania in Australia, the island state. We have the Cape Grim Air Quality Monitoring Station there. It is the cleanest air in the world. It's the baseline monitoring. Last week, it registered 400 parts per million. 400 parts per million. That is the highest it has been in 23 million years on this planet. Now, 350.org gets its name for campaigning for 350 parts per million. 1.5 means we have to get back to 350 and yet we've already hit 400. So we don't have time to build the sort of global consensus that we are talking about as if we had the luxury of time. Urgency is everything. We need global emissions to peak. Certain, well, they were meant to peak by 2015, but because we missed it, the scientists have pushed it out to 2020. We have to get global uh, emissions to peak by then. So I can answer the question as to why Rubio et al. don't talk about climate. It's because the people who fund the Republican Party campaign do not want them to talk about climate. And this goes back to Machiavelli, 15th century, who said there's nothing more difficult to bring about than a change in the order of things, or more dangerous for that matter, because the vested interests who are set to lose will fight to keep their power, and those who believe in the new order are only lukewarm in fighting for it. And that's the key here. What we need is to take back our democracies, our Western democracies, because they have become plutocracies. They have become influenced by crony capitalism, as someone put it to me last night, young James here. It is absolutely what has happened, and the vested interests of the fossil fuel age, supported by massive funding, are making sure that in Australia, in the US and around the world fight constantly for the lowest common denominator which will deliver, as Jan said, three degrees under the Paris Agreement. So what we have to do is recognise that we don't have time to build a long-term consensus. What we, the people, have to do is take back the power and exercise that power on politics to make sure that parliamentarians understand they're not serving the interests of their donors, they will actually lose their seats because civil society will take on the market. That's essentially where we have to be. Thank you. Margie? I can't say I, I don't agree with what you're saying, because I do, but what the way I think about this, and. Environment America is an organization here in the U.S. that's working to get more and more people involved in the effort to build a cleaner and greener and healthier country. And I believe we do have consensus in the one place that we need it, 
and that's on the science. The science is crystal clear, 97, 98, even 99% of scientists have told us that the only scientists who haven't are those who are funded by the fossil fuel industries. So with that consensus, what I believe we really need is a powerful movement. And so how we build that movement is, to, is why I came to Tucson today, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you, because I think young people need to be at the vanguard of that movement. What we already have, certainly in the US, and I believe this is true around the world, is the majority of people believe climate change is real and it's happening and humans are responsible for it. And that's good enough to move us in the right direction. On top of that majority support, I think we need three things. One is we need to start building leadership on this issue. So in, a in addition to people getting involved, we need their mayors, we need local businesses, we need priests and we need rabbis and we need people who run solar companies, all to help build that consensus for action. And then on top of that, we need great stories. People only act if they really can envision what's happening. And I know this was true for me too, I've worked on this issue for 20 years, but it's only when Superstorm Sandy hit the East Coast where my family lived a few years ago and my hometown was wiped out. The boardwalk at Long Beach, which is the center of the city was gone that it became personal for me. And so we need the story so that everyone doesn't have to live through tragedy herself. We can learn from other people's and be motivated by other people's stories. And then the final ingredient is we need deep leadership among activists. And that's where I think young people need to set the stage. And you all are already doing it, so it's our problem, not yours. I mean, young people certainly in this country are more than 75% in support of doing something on climate change. Young people in this country are already taking action on their college campuses, demanding that um, their colleges divest from fossil fuels. Young people are already at the leadership end of calling for 100% renewables. But where young people in this country still have work to do is at the ballot box. So I'm so psyched that all of you raised your hand as registered voters. If what you do over the next couple of months is help us register everybody else who's eligible to vote and then turn them out at the polls with this as their priority, it's that kind of leadership on top of the stories, on top of the local electeds, on top of the majority of people, on top of the science. That's what we need to solve this problem. Thank you. Jan? I said it already, just one sentence. I asked you to study your students very often or just have that continue to study not only what are the consequences of climate change etc but also what are the causes but then analyze analyze the power relations behind it and let's call a spade the spade it is very difficult to deal with climate change in a situation of capitalism because it is big capitalist power which has its interests in order to shift the consequences of economic behavior onto the shoulders of poor people, people outside the market, future generations, etc. That has to be changed. It can be changed on the basis of consensus. The consensus is there amongst the people. You have to translate the consensus in binding regulations in law, like you have done for instance, with regard to other issues, freedom in this country, you have a constitution. Without the constitution, you will be less free amongst yourselves. Translate values into regulations and law and have institutions which see to compliance. Okay. Uh, the second issue I want to have them address a little bit is, okay, we've talked about money, politics, the difficulties that the capitalist system and money and politics in these corporations um, present. And, and it sometimes feels insurmountable when you start to think about it. 
But people are doing things, and one of the things that's really interesting is this concept of intergenerational justice. There's a gentleman uh, scientist named James Hansen. I don't know if you've any, has any of you have heard of him. He was the first person to uh, bring the issue of climate change before Congress, um, and he is an activist now. He's retired, and he's involved with uh, some organizations that are trying to file lawsuits uh, to bring uh, this concept that this generation or this generation of politicians owes younger generations certain uh, standards. And again, you know, going back to the dereliction of duty concept that I felt in Miami, there are lawsuits actually being filed down there, I believe, uh, against in certain counties that are starting to go underwater against politicians. So this concept of intergenerational justice do the, do, do the legal frameworks exist? And I'd like our panel to address, you know, these are this is a concrete way to go about this. And, and does anybody have examples of it and information that could be used by the people here in the audience to proceed and move this forward? Mm -hmm. Well, I can start there. I've joined a, uh, an NGO in the United States, Climate Accountability, because they're looking very much at trying to find a way to hold uh, corporates to account for their contribution to the uh, levels of greenhouse gases that have led to extreme weather events. But having said that, it is uh, very difficult to prove that any one company is responsible for a certain percentage of something. But nevertheless, it's worth trying, and there are people with the Centre for International Environmental Law working with the Union of Concerned Scientists and NGOs to try and do this. But legal frameworks um, are powerful. Just getting it to court, it doesn't matter even if it gets thrown out. Getting it to court forces companies to have to do risk assessments at their board level, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess from, from uh, my point of view, uh, I would say that the key thing to do to break all this down is to think globally and act locally at the in the level of capacity that you can do. Every one of you will be interested in something, whether it's... Um, uh, whether it's saving a particular area for mining or logging, whether it's about shifting to renewable energy, whether it's about stopping coal and gas, whatever it is, politics, though, is required. Regulations are made by elected parliamentarians, whether at the local, state, national, global, however you want to look at it. That is where the decision is made. So certainly be credible in your personal life, but it, it's too late to just rely on that. We have to get organised. We have to join. You have to become part of a movement. And politics is central to it. So find ways to engage. Intergenerational equity is real. Justice is real. But it is justice also for Indigenous people, for people in the Pacific <coughs> who are already losing their islands, already losing their capacity to grow food. This is happening right now. And it will lead to conflict and is leading to conflict and displacement of people. You know, it's all connected. So the key thing for me is find a way to engage and make sure you add your voice to that political outcome. It can be done, it must be done, and an example is Adani in Australia. If that coal mine goes ahead, it would become the seventh biggest emitter in the world if it was a country. That's how big that mine is. And the community movement has frightened off every global investor from investing in that project. Government has given it the say-so, but the community has said to the corporates, we won't support you if you fund that project. So just getting involved at the level you can makes a difference. Margie. Yes, there are legal structures. Um, and in fact, people are using them very efficiently and effectively in this country. Some young people won a lawsuit already on the West Coast, and I live in Massachusetts where young people also just won a lawsuit that's saying that companies do owe them for their future. Who knows how that will play out? But similarly, I don't think we have time for more and more lawsuits, nor do I think any of you should go to law school. What I think you should do is just do what you can right now together. So our individual actions are really important and we should all be doing the best we can personally. But these are societal problems and the only way to move them is as a society. So I think collective action is the most important thing we can do. And I see two immediate ways for you to be doing that. One is through politics. We do live in a democracy. And as much as money dominates that, it's still people who turn out at ballot boxes if they turn out. And I assure you, at the local level, 
we can win. We can even win in the state legislative races. We can even win in governor's offices. And frankly, I believe we can win in the Congress, House, Senate, and when it comes to the president, if we register and vote and do it collectively. So don't just register yourself. Bring people with you. Every time you think about climate, bring somebody else with you. We have to do it together. We have a government that is forced to be responsible if we hold it responsible. So that's number one. And number two, we do live in a capitalist society and the market is king in America and you are the largest demographic. You spend more money than almost anybody except for your grandparents who spend it on you. So you're double whammy here. You both spend it and you get it spent on you and there is no reason for you not to take full control of it. Don't buy from companies that have a bad track record. Don't wear logos of companies that have a bad track record. Don't invest in companies that have a bad track record. And definitely don't go work for companies that have a bad track record. You control the economy. You need to take that responsibility and use it. John? Intergenerational justice, that was the question. Two dimensions, to the past and to the future. People, in US, Canada, Europe, Australia, Japan, etc., the rich countries are quite wealthy because of, you face it, plundering and pillaging other countries in the past, in colonial periods, and First Nations in their own countries. Now, I'm 76, you are younger. Of course, I was not guilty but I have some responsibility because I am living in a situation of comfort which was based on that exploitation during the past. If I do not take that responsibility serious by changing relations, fighting for it, then I'm guilty. That's the difference between responsibility and guilt. Secondly, the future. I have to three grandchildren. You will get grandchildren. What we have decided, that was more or less a consensus in the Declaration for Human Rights, that there are equal human rights to all people, irrespective of everything. All people means also the yet unborn people. They belong to our society. Future people have exactly the same rights as you and I to have a decent life. What we are doing at the moment is relying on technology. We think that in the future technology will do the job, like technology has enabled us also to deal with a number of problems. And now we think that the future generations will also do the same, which is highly uncertain. Moreover, we think that technology will also solve the problems which we are creating for them. And that is irresponsible. So we really have, on the basis of the whole idea of sustainability, to transform those economic relations. Thank you. Uh, we have a f just a few minutes left, and I'd like to open it to the floor. Uh, you have a wealth of experience here, political people. Um, one, minute. one minute. Okay, so we have time for one or two questions. Quickly, um, who's got a hand up? There's a young lady there. Um, how we should t uh, take responsibility to hold companies responsible for their actions as well as politicians. So what is one like strategy that you would suggest that we use besides just being motivated? Look at who you bank with, check out what their policies are and shift to another institution uh, or telecommunications, any company that you deal with, look at what they stand for, write to them and say you are leaving them and shifting to somebody else because of their position on climate. You can do that tonight. There's, a, there's another question back there. Why don't we let that person ask? And what, what, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, not a question, but you can also switch to Credo Mobile. They're based in San Francisco. 
they finance nothing that has to do with the Koch brothers or environmental uh, degradation. They support women, they support human rights, they support LGBT rights, and um, I have been a member for a number of years, and I can convince no one Sir, I don't mean to cut you off, but we're actually down to zero, second, zero seconds here. Can we take one more question? Or question let's be prayer to the left side here. Yeah. Margie? It's too late to stave off all the problems of climate change. We're already experiencing them here in this country and even more severely around the world. But it is not too late to stave off the worst. And certainly, it's not too late to make a difference. And we don't want the, the worst consequences on our conscience. So act. I would not worry about is the perfect thing. I would worry about can you do it. So meet with your friends and call your legislator. Get out your cell phone, call your legislator and say, what are you doing to get us to 100% renewable energy? If everybody in this room did that, we'd get more votes for 100% renewable energy. Great. Well, Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Round for our panel. Great panel. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs>